Nelson has a rare genetic disease which is gradually destroying his body. He was born with it because his mother and father are first cousins. More than half of British Pakistanis marry their first cousins. Tonight on Dispatches, the tragic consequences of a cultural practice that is devastating children's lives. Mohsin Akhtar is 17 years old and lives with his family in Bradford. He's the second of six children. He's blind, he can't walk properly and needs round-the-clock care. Mawson is losing his hearing, his speech is seriously impaired, and he understands little of what's happening around him. Mawson is obsessed with the idea of driving, not realizing this will never be possible. Mohsin's younger sister, Hina, is 13. She's the Akhtar's fourth child. Her sister, Zainab, is 11. Both sisters have inherited the same disease as Mohsin. They can neither see nor hear. All three children have an extremely rare genetic disorder called mucolipidosis type 4. Their bodies cannot get rid of waste products properly affecting everyday brain function from vision to movement. Ah. bread <laughs> 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 The potential consequences of first cousin marriages are tragic and devastating. My grandparents were first cousins. Five of their daughters died in childhood and three of my uncles were born deaf. At the time, no one knew why because the facts were not known. Today, the medical facts are established, but the practice continues. Here in Bradford, where the Akhtars live, 75% of Pakistanis marry their first cousins. Anywhere between 4 and 10% of the children in these families will be born with genetic abnormalities. And these illnesses are often fatal. One third of children with diseases caused by recessive genes will die before they turn 5. The disease affecting Mohsin, Hina and Zainab is the direct result of their mother and father being first cousins. Both parents carry the recessive gene that has caused the children's disabilities. If they had married outside of the family, there would have been only a tiny chance of their children being born with the genetic disorder. But in the case of the Akhtars, as first cousins, the odds narrowed dramatically to a one in four chance that any child they had would be born with the illness. In the event, three of their six children were born with the disease. Fatima is the youngest and healthy. She's seven years old and has had to watch her siblings deteriorate over the years. So what's it like living, having two sisters? Is it fun? <clears throat> what's the best bit? I play together. What's the most difficult bit? Do you know like when they cry, they're crying uh, and we can't stop them crying? You upset it like you are. You are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. You are
वैसे वो सोचता है ना कि मैं गाड़ी चला सकूँ मैं जिस तरह बच्चे बाहर जाते हैं लेके गाड़ी ऐसे वो करता है ना उसका जहन ये एक बात कबूल नहीं करता कि मैं ब्लाइंड हो चुका हूँ हाउ डू यू फील बहुत दुख होता है कि उनके ये बच्चा बहुत नॉर्मल था अगर ये बच्चे नॉर्मल होते तो अपने अपने घर के हो जाते वक़्त के साथ साथ अपना आप संभाल लेते तो एज वाइज तो मुझे बहुत मुश्किल महसूस हो रहा है ना मैं कैसे इनको करूँगी डील Over in Birmingham, home to one of the largest Pakistani communities in Britain, 50% marry their first cousins. The children born into these families are 10 times more likely to be born with recessive genetic disorders, and one in 10 of those will die in infancy or suffer a chronic disability. Doctors in Birmingham have grave concerns about cousin marriages, or as they call it, consanguinity. Dr David Milford is a renal specialist at the Birmingham Children's Hospital. He says the problem is on the rise. What kind of impact of first cousin marriages have you seen in this hospital? In my own specialty which is children's kidneys, we've seen um from national data comparing figures from 2004 to recent figures 2008 2009, we've seen that the proportion Uh, of consanguineous relations with genetic disease we've seen that increase from about 17% to 21% so certainly in our own very small specialty area we have seen a change most of the consanguineous marriages are within uh, muslim pakistani and bangladeshi families so for us it's wherever populations of um, th- those origins where they are concentrated that's where we see uh, the the highest no- amount of uh, genetic disease What kind of pressure do these cases put on the resources that you have? We see some children with very serious disease. We've had children who presented soon after birth with kidney failure requiring artificial kidney treatment uh, and they then go on to require kidney and liver transplantation to correct their genetic defect. Um and then we see other children who are more mildly affected who have some degree of kidney impairment but not enough to require artificial kidney treatment or transplantation. So it's quite variable. A major report published in 2008 shows that one third of all children suffering from rare genetic diseases are British Pakistani. Yet they only make up 1.5% of the total population. More than 70 published British scientific studies have shown that cousin marriages lead to an increased chance of having a child born with a rare genetic disorder. A significant number of these children will have serious kidney or liver problems. As you can see, I've got a lot, lot of medicine there. There's a carnitine. Oh, for carn, I've got, I've got two of them a daily. And these are one of other day. That carnitine, I've got that day and that. And then I've got some more there. They're basically all for the liver, basically. Azmat Mahmood lives in Nelson, Lancashire. He's 17 years old and lives with his mum, Parveen. God, I smell these medicines really bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He has to take yeah. a powerful cocktail of medications to help him get through his day. Sometimes as many as 11 tablets at a time. He has a rare genetic condition called propionic acidemia. He lacks an enzyme that breaks down protein in the body. No, you all have them in morning. Yeah, one and a half. Azmat was diagnosed at 15 months old and was one of the youngest children in the UK ever to have a liver transplant. And that's it. And put them back. And there I've had my medicine and I'll just go with water. These, these medicines are a lot strong, so it, it, can, it can make you a bit harper sometimes. So, a lot of medicines. I've got to keep... If I don't have them, then I can feel a bit weird sometimes, not, not myself. So, it's, it's important that I have them. 
When Osmat was first diagnosed, his doctors told Parveen that his rare liver condition was hereditary. By marrying her first cousin, she and her husband increased the chances of passing the disease on to their children. So after his transplant, oh, bless him. It was when he was born. Just he wasn't drinking his milk and things and he was lethargic. So I did some tests, you know, um, that's when they found out when there was something not right. Uh, well, at first they said there was no cure. And then, because um, I kept pushing it, whenever I went to the clinic, I said, there must be something you can do. And they said, well, we can try a liver transplant, but there's no, it's not 100% guarantee it's going to work. Asmat's rare condition is progressive and his body is slowly deteriorating. This one, like this one's more weaker. It's just like wearing out. I, I don't know what to do for it, but I like, start getting worse. Like, you know, like you have pains and stuff. And mm -hmm. that, as you can see, that's a bit sm smaller. This arm's a bit smaller, but whereas this feels more stronger. Like sleeping and stuff, when I and sleep on the side, it could hurt sometimes. Like my mum has to massage you all the time. Ah, oh, that's sweet, isn't it? You're Thanks. Welcome. Did you make it yourself? Yeah, I made it myself. Did you manage? Yeah, I managed to make it. I made it. Oh, myself. cool. Yeah. They haven't been doing a uh, liver transplants that long in children for them to know how long will it it will last. But I try not to think about that. Cousin marriages have been a long-established cultural tradition amongst many British Pakistani families. But it's not just within this community. In the past, the British royal family married their first cousins too. Today, though, it is mostly Pakistani, Bangladeshi and some Middle Eastern and East African families that continue the custom. Shafkat Mirza is a journalist and has lived in Sheffield with his family for the last 30 years. He invited me to his local community centre to meet friends, some of whom are married to their first cousins. They said they've never experienced any health problems. Is it a good patch? Oh, yes. In Sheffield, we've got about a population of about 25,000 Pakistanis living. What's your view about cousin marriages? For 800 years, we are we prefer to marry within our families. May not be the first cousin, maybe the second cousin or third cousin, but we marry. I am married uh, for the last 25 years successfully with my first cousin, and I've got five children. And thanks to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that they are all fine and well. Uh, I'm married to my first cousin. Yeah, I've seen many benefits of it. You're in the same circle of relatives as your partner and they have a real understanding and often probably go that extra mile. My wife is my mother's sister's daughter. Yeah, we are cousins, but... You know what I mean? Thank you, know I mean? subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thank you, my children, all three are healthy. So would you encourage your children to marry cousins? If they want to. Shafkat has been married to his first cousin, Shazia Khanum, for 35 years. Ah, mangoes. <laughs> <laughs> His mum and dad, Farnam Begum and Ali Bahadur, are also first cousins. Shafkat's eldest son, Imran, has continued the family tradition and just married his first cousin in Pakistan. That's three generations of first cousin marriage. So what is the benefit of the cousin? The benefit is that we have a problem with each other, we have a تقسیم کرتے مانتے ہیں میری بہو یہ میری تقریب کو تقریب کو محسوس کرتی ہے اور یہ احساس کر کے یہ فوراً پہنچتی ہے کہ ان کی مدد کو پہنچو اگر اس کو کوئی تکلیف ہوتی ہے تو میں فوراً پہنچتا ہوں اسی طریقے اس ان کو جو آپس میں ہمدردی ہوگی اگر ہم باہر سے شادی کریں گے تو وہ ہمیں ہمدردی نہیں مل سکے گی اس اس ویری ہیپی ایٹموسفیئر فار ایگزامپل اے ویکینڈس آل دی فیملیز گیٹ ٹوگیدر at this house and we call dad's house like white house you know everybody is calling to this parliament and they would have food together they would have chats together 
जो इसके बहन भाई हो ये पहले मुझसे प्यार करते हैं तो इसी की वजह से ज़्यादा करते हैं हम उधर जाते हैं तो हमारा जो घर है उधर मुझे जाने ही नहीं देते वो बोलते हैं इधर ही रहें हमारे पास हम आपका देखभाल करेंगे क्या उसमें ज़्यादा मोहब्बत प्यार होता है ना अगर कुछ बोल भी जाए ना जो बड़े हैं तो इतना महसूस नहीं होता क्योंकि हम रिश्तेदारी ऐसी होती है बहन भाई होते हैं उनके अगर अलाद एक दूसरे के घर शादी हो जाती है We haven't seen any negativity in it, so therefore we are all for it. Although between four and ten percent of the children of first cousins are at a high risk of recessive disorders, people who support cousin marriages say this means that 90 to 96 percent of the time the children will be healthy. People outside the Asian community or the Pakistani community would say, "Well, why would you want to marry a cousin? You know, there are health risks, and also, you know, look outside. They won't quite get it. You know, yeah, they, they see it a completely what, different way." My answer to that would be, "Why wouldn't you want to marry yeah, a cousin? cousin so, yeah. Not why would you, but why wouldn't you? I mean, all right, there's the points of the health risk, but then there's the advantages where you know the family." My children had no biological disadvantage because we are first cousins. And so by the way, our parents were first cousins. I know. As well. She was telling me earlier. So both your parents are first cousins. And, 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 and you're, we are first cousins. And you're first cousins. So why wouldn't you ask your children, or why aren't you encouraging children? I would uh, no, no, no. I would not stop them. At least five research papers show cousin marriages are on the rise in the UK, and have been increasing for the last three decades. On the streets, though, we found quite a number of British Pakistanis who thought the practice was wrong. And suggested that young people only went along with it because of family pressure. I personally think it's wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like everything aside, right? But first, because of my, it's a bit wrong. I think it's a bit incest, to be honest. When it comes to sleeping, you think no chance. I can't do it. But it's just like sleeping with your brother. Do you know what I mean? And it's just horrible that is. So, what kind of pressure do you think there is on people to marry their cousins? Blackmail. I think it's. Mother goes, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm, it's the, we call it drama bazi, <laughs> where they, where they'll say, you know, better please marry this girl, please my, you know, uh, you know, my 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 izzat, which is my, my respect, my honour is on it. Well, mostly, most of the cousin marriages are forced marriages. I mean, to be honest, most of the girls get forced into it, or most of the boys get forced into it. Dad will come home and say to your sister, right, so and so, you're getting married to. Him. Why? Because he's your cousin's brother or something like that. And then the girl has to say yes. I mean, she's got no other choice, has she? When you say force, you mean that like they they can't they want physical well, force. Well, it's it's it's, it's, it's uh, what, what's the word? Uh, emotionally blackmail. Yeah. They've been told, oh, we are parents. We did all this for you. Blah blah blah. We came to this country. Blah blah blah. And, and now so it's, much, it's and yeah. Now you can't do this for us. So it's it's, it's yeah, your turn now. We've done we've done have our. Have you guys ever been in that position? Not yet. Hopefully not. Most first cousin marriages in the UK are between British Pakistanis. A change in immigration law has made it harder to marry a spouse from abroad. However, first cousins are sometimes still brought in from Pakistan. The government's forced marriage unit says they deal with 1,500 cases a year. Half are linked to Pakistan. Some involve young British men and women who are pressurised into marrying their first cousins against their will. How did you feel about that at the time? Really angry because I wasn't asked. It wasn't even considered. I was very, very angry. I met Zara, who is British, but married her first cousin from Pakistan. She asked us to hide her identity. We met uh, when I went to Pakistan with my family, and then a couple of weeks later, I was told that I was uh, going to be engaged to him. I refused to marry him. It was about two weeks before we were due to get married. Were you forced into it? I was emotionally blackmailed. Yeah, I was. My husband's family, they went on hunger strike. They said, we're going to commit suicide, this, that. It was a matter of their honour because I had been engaged to my cousin for a long time. And so I was uh, kind of emotionally blackmailed into it. And it's still going on. Uh, my friend, she was married to her cousin and money got involved. And they went to Pakistan to sort the situation out. And they were in court. And as she was walking out of court, her husband shot her. She was pregnant at the time. People out there, it's just frightening. Were you ever wor worried about anything like that happening? Yes, yeah. I am, and in the future of that happening. First cousin marriages can end in tragedy. Just recently, a British couple was shot dead in Pakistan. Here in the UK, the bigger problem is the medical issue. In part two, we discover people are denying the health risks of cousin marriages.
In Bradford at the Achter family home, life is unbearably difficult. Martin feels constantly frustrated. His two sisters, Hina and Zenab, are unable to look after themselves and their sight and hearing is getting worse. Their parents find it hard to come to terms with the idea that as first cousins, they pass down a gene that caused their children's terrible disabilities. What have the doctors actually told you about this? You told you that it's, it could be anything to do with the fact that you two are first cousins? Yes, they told this is a genetic disease, but I don't think this is right, but they told us. My other, my other brother, he got married with her sisters. He got five children, all of them perfectly right, there's no disability with them. I to say that if we start here, my children were not like this. My normal, the routine the children were not good, that every time they to the चक्कर आ रहे हैं डॉक्टर की दवाइयां दे दे के तो बच्चे इस तरह हो गए हैं क्योंकि बच्चे बिल्कुल नॉर्मल थे मैं तो अभी तक मैं मुझे यकीन नहीं आता कि मेरे बच्चे इस तरह हो चुके हैं क्या ब्लेम करना बस ये हमारी किस्मत में था ये आजमाइश सम फैमिलीज कॉल इट फेट हाउएवर डॉक्टर्स आर इन नो डाउट अबाउट द कॉज वाइल एन एवरेज चिल्ड्रंस हॉस्पिटल विल सी 20 टू 30 डिफरेंट रिसेसिव जेनेटिक डिसऑर्डर्स ओवर अ डेकेड इन ब्रैडफोर्ड वन चिल्ड्रंस हॉस्पिटल अलोन हैज सीन 165 कॉन्सिक्वेंटली ब्रैडफोर्ड एनएचएस हॉस्पिटल्स ट्रस्ट हैज इनिशिएटेड वन ऑफ द वर्ल्ड्स मोस्ट कॉम्प्रिहेंसिव स्टडीज लुकिंग एट द हेल्थ ऑफ 14000 बेबीज ओवर द नेक्स्ट 20 इयर्स at the same time establishing the full medical consequences of cousin marriage on children's well-being. Professor Marcus Pembry is a former government advisor on genetic health and a clinical geneticist. For any particular gene you get two copies, one from your mother and one from your father. If you have a single defective uh, gene, or mutation as we call it, um, there's no outward manifestation. And this can just be passed from parents to children to children to grandchildren with no effect. It's only when both parents happen to be carriers and then there is a 25% chance that a child would get the double dose. They have no normal gene and they suffer from the disease. First cousins share grandparents. And if you imagine that uh, um, a rare recessive uh, mutation, um, single copy in a, one of the grandparents, uh, there is then not unusual for it to be passed on to both grandparents' children and, and then on to their offspring, who are the cousin. On average, um, if you're a carrier, then there's a one-eighth chance, 12.5% chance, that your first cousin would also be carrying that gene. Asmat helps out in his mum's school and baby wear shop. When he's not at college, he works on the shop floor, deals with customers and mans the till. I'm very protective over Azmat. He's like more like, um, I would say, a 14-year-old than an 18-year-old. Mentally, you know. It comes with me, um, you know, when he's on holiday, he comes with, with me to work, yeah. So we can keep an eye on him and things. I've got to tidy it up every time because Customers are always on the side and then they just put them back so you both sort them out. It's somewhere to do anyway because I get bored because it's somewhere instead of just standing on till all the time. Despite what Azmat's mum has been told about the cause of his illness, she struggles to accept it. I don't think there's anything wrong in uh, first cousin marriages because it's all culture and it's the norm really. But having said that, I want to. It did put me off having more to my ex-husband now, but, you know, because I couldn't go through that again, having another child with the same problem. The thing is, though, it's not guaranteed that it's going to happen, though. It's like high risk, it's one in four, but it could be, like, if it's one in four, it's like three could be okay. Yeah, just think it was one of those things. Because um, my daughter, she's fine. 
Yeah, what's that? What's he bought? Right, right. Azmat's older sister Syra also Good lives time. at home and helps out at the shop when she yeah, can. When I was young, I couldn't understand, well, why was I born perfectly fine and stuff, and my mother had a condition and things like that. A lot of families think it's just luck. Yeah, they look, you know, the way it's meant to be, or God's will, as they say. That's how it is perceived, I think. In Sheffield, when I talked to the local community, some did accept the medical evidence, but others felt any criticism of cousin marriages was an attack on British Pakistanis. The community does feel that it's being targeted all the time at the minute, whether that be through the prevent agenda, forced marriages, you know, first cousin marriages now, and the community is like battening down its hatches and not wanting to engage, not wanting to you know, share the experiences and, you know, it, it does feel like, you know, we're drowning in all sorts of attacks here. I don't see any reason, any high prevalence of a particular disease in Pakistan where people have been marrying from centuries for, with, with the first cousins. But scientifically, there's an evidence that, you know, children are being born um, with disabilities from first cousin marriages. If that is true and evidence is there, then obviously identifying the issue and then basically raising awareness amongst the communities, that is something I feel needs to happen. They should talk about it, but it's how you talk about it. If you make it, a, you should make it a general thing rather than target it at a certain community. People in the community are going to hold their hand up and say, oh, us again. Cousin marriage uh, is really, I, I think, uh, it's about time that we should really have seriously to think about that because our young, coming generation, they are suffering. The consequences of cousin marriages are a major public health issue. It costs the NHS many millions and has huge implications for other services. A government study shows that British Pakistanis are three times more likely to have children with learning disabilities than the general population. And it costs nearly a quarter of a million pounds a year to care for each child. So what are politicians doing? We approached 16 MPs with a significant number of British Pakistani constituents for an interview. All of them declined. We also asked 30 MPs who represent these communities to give their views on a survey. Only one who wanted to remain anonymous replied. He didn't answer the survey but told us it is a subject which evokes very strong emotional responses. And anybody seeking to raise a subject, even by way of giving professional medical advice, runs the risk of being attacked by individuals who have their own agenda, often political. Why was it received so badly? One politician who would talk to us was former MP for Keighley in West Yorkshire, Anne Cryer. She's been criticised in the past for trying to discuss the health problems caused by cousin marriages. Do you see it then, first and foremost, as a public health issue rather than an issue about the community that one has to tiptoe around? It's a public health issue and we deal with public health issues by raising awareness, by talking about the subject, such as obesity, such as drug addiction, such as alcohol. But for some reason, uh, we're told that we mustn't talk about cousin marriages uh, because this is a sensitive issue. Now, I think that's absurd. We have to talk about this issue in order to find solutions. And you're a lone voice, a lone public voice for willing to talk about this. Why are there so few politicians prepared to come forward and say, look, we need to tackle this? I think it's fear that they'll be accused of either racism or demonisation or whatever, and therefore they keep their head below the parapet and don't say things on this issue. It's partly about uh, getting votes and securing those votes and uh, not, uh, not offending uh, the, um, the leadership of these communities. One Birmingham councillor backs the idea of open discussion. Salma Yaqub believes the key to tackling the problem lies in the way you talk about cousin marriages. Why do you think it is that people feel so stigmatised? Why won't they talk about it? It's just far too sensitive. 
Well, I think after 9-11, Muslims have felt that they've been stereotyped, demonised, just seen through this lens of terrorism, seen as a problematic community. So any discussion around Muslims is to do with some negative issue. So this issue, for example, which is a health issue, if it's framed around, well, why aren't these people stopping doing what they're doing in the face of Western scientific evidence? Of course people are going to be defensive, whereas if it's, well, here's what the evidence is, people can now make informed choices and don't politicise it in the way that we talk about it and see it as a straightforward health issue and deal with it as such, and I feel we'll have a very different discussion around it. Islamic experts say that Islam neither prohibits nor encourages cousin marriages. Some argue, though, that if change is to happen, community and religious leaders need to get on board. But Molana Munawar Hussain, a religious scholar in the West Midlands, does not accept that there is a problem. 30% of children with rare diseases are from British Pakistani families. What's your response to that kind of statistic? What is the, I will ask, what is the percentage in other communities? But Malana, you know, doctors are saying that there's a link. Families who are suffering from this, who are first cousins, who are British, British Pakistani Muslim, are saying there's a link. The specialists in this area are saying that there's a link. Why are you not accepting that? Well, I don't have any knowledge on in that regard. Look, I have a, a whole, I mean, you know, reams and reams of evidence here, scientific evidence that proves that there's a link, and you're still denying it. No, what I said, I don't have knowledge on that. Well, if I gave you the evidence and you looked through it and you felt that it was convincing, what would you do about it? I don't think I will be able to do anything on that regard. Islamically, I do not see any problem getting married to the first cousin. Maybe not Islamically, but medically there's a problem. Why we are talking about only the Islam, Muslims getting married to the first cousin, then the, if we find the same problem in other communities also, then it is equal. So a, it is not because of the first cousin marriage. So it is a normal case. It is because case. of the first cousin marriage. It's just not because necessarily because they're Pakistani or they're white or they're black or they're any other ethnic group. It's because they're first cousins. And that is a much higher occurrence of that happening within the Pakistani community because there's a tradition of marrying first cousins. OK, well, I, as I said early on, I don't have any research on that uh, topic, so I won't be able to say anything on that. Well, if I give you this research and you look through it... So, no. well, I, I wouldn't mind uh, looking through it. And if you were convinced by it, what would you do about it? Uh, I will decide after when I am con convinced. We sent him the medical papers and haven't heard back yet. It's a bit hard actually to tackle the issues of these children. I don't know what is their future, how they will live even if we are not here. In part three, we ask if children like the Akhtars are paying the price of political correctness because health workers and politicians are afraid of being labelled racist. Difficult life. <laughs> With scientific research showing that first cousins who marry are doubling their chances of having children with rare diseases, why is there so little awareness of this in the wider British population? Sonia and Wayne Gibbs invited me to their family home. They've been together for 16 years. Wayne is Sonia's dad's cousin, making them first cousins once removed, something that never struck them as a problem. Their child, Nicole, died of juvenile osteopetrosis, a genetic disease that causes the bones to thicken and crush the body's organs. They were told it was because they both carried recessive genes. So as a parent, to sort of go from having what you thought was a perfectly healthy, normal baby, how did that feel? Upsetting. Horrible. Feel absolutely helpless. Because you know there's just not a thing you can do. Did you decide to have a third child? Was that planned? Well, we went through, obviously, genetic counselling, what they call it. Because obviously we wanted to know, you know, can we have any more children. For that test for you was absolutely essential. It was, yes. yeah, it was, it was vital. Yeah, it was vital. There was no way we was going to even, you know, have another child if there was no test out there that could help. 
I don't know, so I just would have stuck at Nathan and that would have been it. So, and now you've got two very and healthy now I've got kids. Two very healthy boys. Do you think that people who are cousins and are thinking about getting married and at some point having children, do you think they should test themselves at that stage? Definitely. Absolutely. It will save them so much heartache in the long run. At least then they know that they are going to have a healthy child. For couples like Wayne and Sonia, going through genetic counselling helps establish risks and offers possible solutions. The option of a termination or IVF to implant a healthy embryo. But only 40% of genes causing recessive disorders can be tested for, meaning that genetic counselling has its limits. And yet, there is no national public health campaign about cousin marriages. The risks are not taught in schools, and there is no government leafleting campaign in hospitals or doctor surgeries, as there would be about other diseases affecting children. The last big campaign on cousin marriages was 13 years ago in Birmingham, when the health risks were brought to public attention. Dr Jackie Chambers, the Director of Health in the city, explains how some British Pakistanis opposed the initiative. What was the reaction to your campaign at the time? Well, I think the reaction was quite mixed. Um, we did get some support from some religious leaders and from some communities. Um, and for about two years, um, we were, within the context of promoting healthy mothers and healthy babies, getting some awareness um, of, of the message about the additional risks. We found out subsequently that there was also quite a hostile undercurrent. Um, people were tearing up our leaflets and they were also putting counter messages um, across in terms of what was seen as an attack on, on those communities. With the campaign provoking such a negative response, it wasn't repeated. Now normal practice is to advise individual families most at risk, rather than high-profile national health programmes discouraging cousin marriage. Professor Marcus Pembry feels that targeting families individually, rather than issuing national public health initiatives, is the way forward. You are against the idea of it being a public health issue, but Many people we've spoken to, many doctors and people who work with local authorities, say that the cost of the NHS is absolutely enormous and therefore we need to make it a public health issue so as to reduce the problem. Of course we have to tackle it, but it's not like smoking where people want to smoke and the public health uh, campaign is trying to stop them smoking. These families don't want to have children with these diseases. Uh, we're all on the same side. They just need help. They're not going to change their cousin marriage uh, 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 straight away because it's part and parcel of their, their community and their community is very supportive of them. What they want is help with these specific genetic disorders and with the new technology where if there's political will, we're not, we're not wanting the politicians to say things, what we want to do is to understand that we need funding for the services that uh, uh, will provide uh, genetic counselling. In Birmingham, they're introducing a new system. A confidential register of families most at risk of recessive disorders is being drawn up. They will be offered counselling and genetic testing, which is hoped will reduce the number of children born with disabilities by half over the next decade. If it works, the plan is for the government to roll this out to cities such as Bradford and London. However, British Pakistani doctors at one GP practice in Birmingham have set themselves apart from other health professionals by openly discouraging cousin marriage. Their surgery is one of the few in the country to take this radical approach. At the same time, they've introduced genetic screening and testing for common blood disorders, such as thalassemia, for all of their patients. Really, I just wanted to, to speak to you again and, and talk to you about um, thalassemia and the transmission of... Today, Dr. Rizwan Aladina, himself a British Pakistani, is genetically counselling Hulsam Harji, who is originally from East Africa and married to her first cousin. Hulsam is a thalassemia carrier. She has one healthy baby, but wants more children. So you would either pass on the normal one, or the one with thalassemia, and same with your husband as well. Yeah. So in terms of combinations, this is the dangerous combination when the child has both thalassemia gene and that child 
would be thalassemia major child. But that is one in four chance. Yeah. Okay. The other possibilities are the children being carriers, which is... Helping patients make informed choices is a priority for Dr. Ali Dina. He says he's done this with the help of local religious leaders. It has taken a good time for about almost 20 years to change attitudes, getting the support of the clergy. That is the key. I think at the end of the day, if you do not have the support of the religious leadership within your community, particularly in a Muslim community, then your message is not going to get through. This is not an attack on Islam. It is not an attack on Islamic principles or its fundamentals. It is merely um, concerns from fellow Muslims regarding um, health risks. It is fine to marry your cousin as long as you know the risks that you're taking and as long as you get yourself tested and you're not in an affected partnership. But then, if you look at the amount of genetic illnesses that there are actually there, you can't test for everything. So the sensible thing would be to say, if you can avoid these, um, these partnerships, then it's actually better. We can do marriage with first cousin. According to Sharia, it is clear. I myself marry with my first cousin, my two brothers also, and many other people in my audience. But the reports are in favor that first cousin marriage is the result of disability children. So these are the reports which they showed me. I, I agree with them. Okay. Imam Sadiq Qureshi is the director of the Minhaj al Quran International Mosque in Forest Gate, London. He's married to his first cousin and has two daughters. One of his children was born with a form of inherited deafness. The other suffers from a rare recessive disorder called marble bone disease. He regularly tackles health issues in his Friday sermons and isn't afraid to talk about cousin marriages. It's very clear, cousin marriage is permissible in Islam. It is not, you can say, you must do that or you must not do that. These are the suggestions, guidelines. So what would you say, based on your personal experience, what would you say to you, the people who come to this mosque? I must say as a religious scholar that people must think on this issue and people get awareness, people must learn, go to the GPs, go to the, their consultant, and they must learn about the couple. They are intending marry, marriage with their cousin. They must think before they are taking their decision. If they feel any symptoms, any genes, okay, so they must test themselves before marriage. Okay. In future, might be they get a big situation. Now, in this country, there are many facilities, so they must go for the test, and then that will be, uh, that will be better for their future. According to Islamic viewpoint, this is the big jihad. To bring the health full society, it is the big jihad of this time. Azmat and Mum are at the hospital for his latest checkup. Come on, let's have a look now. That's right, 156. So he's about 5'2". He is 5'2". Five, five, five the doctors need to see him once every six months to monitor his health. This time, the news Hello. isn't good. Hello, nice to see you again, I'm at UK. Have a seat. Well, when I'm playing with my friends, uh, I get tired easily. My legs get tired easily. Your legs get tired easily. Both legs? Yeah. I've been having pains in my arms. Yeah, being so still your arm it's been, it's been carrying on. It's not. It's gone a lot more weak. I feel. Then it closes and it's hard to open sometimes. So it closes by itself. Does it? Yeah, it goes like pretty tight, and then I go like down, I stretch out. Okay. I can't see any circulation before. There's no circulation at all, is there? Put your hands on your hips for me, can you? It starts hurting when I do that. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Just put, put, put your hands on the hips. My granddad tells me to have uh, plenty of milk. Does that help? Yeah. 
Certainly does. Just put your head straight like this. Uh -huh. Can it, can it get better, or does it take time? What they are. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's hard to know. We, we, we haven't managed to completely explain why you've had this trouble. We wouldn't claim in any way to have a complete yeah. cure or treatment for probiotic acidemia by now. Right, so uh, you uh, still haven't found a cure for it? No, because it's a genetic disease that in a way affects yeah. every cell in the body. Oh, sorry. Okay? You alright? Yeah. Come see what I'm doing. During my time making this film, I've seen firsthand the benefits of cousin marriages, but also its tragic consequences. One medical study estimates that nearly 700 British Pakistani children are born with serious disabilities every year. If this was any other health risk in the UK, there'd be a huge national campaign to raise awareness. Until this happens, many more innocent children will be born to lives of unimaginable and preventable suffering. My dream is maybe to uh, get like get a good job and like build something on my son and get married like, like have a family on my own as well. It's like if you're marrying your cousin yeah like you can't always work out because like if you're marrying someone dick like you could have a disease because you don't you don't know what that other cousin's got. So it's it's important say if they have kids yeah you, you don't you don't know if that like say if that cousin's like got a disease or something that like, how that kid could be born because some can be born different, can't they? So, that. so it's important that you think who you're going to marry. That like, marrying into family is not always a good idea. Well, for help and support about the issues raised in this programme, visit the website at channel4.com/dispatches.